A Brief Account in the Life of Horace Greeley, published in 1909. Horace Greeley was born at Amherst, New Hampshire, February 3, 1811, being one of the seven children of Zacchaeus Greeley. He was a precocious youngster and at the age of two began reading the Bible. He was never taught to read, but at the age of three could read easily any children's book, and at four seemed to be able to grasp and understand any book. At a very early age, he amused himself by reading books upside down. These points only emphasize the clearness of his intellect and his unusual ability to grasp a thought. His entire schooling was limited to um, the district school. After he had passed the age of five, no one ever succeeded in giving him a word that he could not spell. In 1826, Horace became a printer's devil at East Paltney. One of his associates in the printing office had this to say of Greenley, or Greeley, excuse me, when he was 33 years old. If ever there was a self-made man, this same Horace Greeley is one. For he had neither wealth nor influential friends, collegiate nor academic, um, academic education, nor anything to start him in the world save his own native good sense, an uncontrollable love of study, and a determination to win his way by his own efforts. In a later letter from the same associate, knowing Horace Greeley as I do and have done for 30 years, I know his integrity, purity, and generosity. In 1830, when 19 years of age, the printing office in which he was employed was closed. He had completed um, his trade as a printer and confronted the world. He went on foot to his father's home in Pennsylvania, shortening his walk by getting occasional rides on canal boats and uh, completing his journey by a walk of 100 miles through the woods. Horace had a year before um, before injured a leg and uh, walked at this time with great difficulty. As soon as he was able to walk again, he went to Jamestown 20 miles away and secured a position at a printing office, but his employer failed to pay him. He finally found himself at work in the office of the Erie Gazette, where his ambition and attentiveness to his work was appreciated. While there, while there he saved all that he earned except for six dollars, his board, room, and washing having been included in his wages. The sum he saved during the seven months was approximately one hundred and fifteen dollars, which he took home and gave to his father, who at that time was in sad need of it. Greeley's experience with Greeley and Company in publishing the paper known as The New Yorker was a considerable setback to him, as while the newspaper was popular, it was far from being profitable. He never drew a dollar out of it as salary or expense. Almost a wreck in 1837, The New Yorker continued to grow until a few years later it had um, really reached a profit-paying basis, Mr. Greeley having um, had during the period seven different partners who did not have the stick to to wait for its success. Mr. Greeley did not make it a uh, real financial success, but he hung on until during the presidential campaign of 1840, the year of Tippecanoe and Tyler II, he was undoubtedly the most potent force in the campaign. Mr. Greeley wrote articles, made speeches, sat on committees, traveled grave, or, traveled great deal, gave advice, and suggested plans. His two newspapers, The Log Cabin and The New Yorker, were later merged in The New York Tribune. In establishing the uh, Tribune, Mr. Greeley furnished all the capital, which was not much from a monetary standpoint. He had, however, great capital and reputation, credit, experience, talent, and opportunity. He was known to be one of um, incorruptible integrity, one who would pay his debts at any and every sacrifice, and one who would not contract an obligation which he was not sure of being able to discharge. Even at this time, there were hundred there were a hundred periodicals published in New York, among which were eleven other daily papers. The Tribune venture was in a very was in every way a success. Mr. Greeley was elected a member of Congress in 1848 to fill the remaining three months of an unexpired term. In 1852, he spent three months in Europe visiting England and the continent. He reported the doings of Congress in his paper during the session of 1856, and he announced that he went to Congress for the purpose of unmasking hypocrisy, putting down treachery, and defeating meanness. 
He was twice assaulted by members of Congress, and several times his life was threatened. The Albany Knickerbocker, knowing him to really be the soul of honor, said, The fellow who would strike Horace Greeley would strike his own mother. Mr. Greeley, however, made no protest, went about unarmed, and continued to call erring congressmen to account, much to the benefit of the entire country. On the first day of May, 1872, at Cincinnati, Mr. Greeley was nominated for the presidency on the sixth ballot by the Liberal Republican Party. Mr. Greeley's popularity was largely traceable to his work both before and during the Civil War in the interest of abolition. This man, who was a farmer, printer, journalist, politician, and an avowed abolitionist, was big enough and broad enough at the close of the Civil War to protest against the prolonged imprisonment of the Confederate President Jefferson Davis and himself signed a bond for Davis's release, an act which at the time was much misunderstood and severely criticized. He opposed General Grant for the presidency, having the nomination of the little liberal Republicans and endorsement of the Democrats, but he was defeated. This defeat killed him, for he died between Election Day and the official casting of the electoral vote. While Grant was elected, Greeley polled almost as many popular votes as Grant did. He was the people's friend, the people's idol, and his impress upon this country can never, ever be erased.